Stad van ontdekkingen. Dat is hoe Leiden zich met recht mag noemen. De Universiteit Leiden behoort al sinds 1575 tot de meest toonaangevende universiteiten ter wereld. En met een campus in de stad van vrede, recht en veiligheid biedt zij haar talenten het beste van twee werelden. Studenten in Leiden en Den Haag worden uitgedaagd om het beste uit zichzelf te halen. En onderzoekers vinden hier de ideale voedingsbodem voor hun baanbrekende werk. Dat gold voor de grote geesten van vroeger en het geldt ook voor de talenten van vandaag en morgen. Echter, talent alleen is niet genoeg. Als we werkelijk de vruchten willen plukken van hun kennis en visie, moeten we talenten de tijd en ruimte geven om tot wasdom te komen. De wereld heeft op dit moment behoefte aan duurzame oplossingen. Dus laten we onderzoekers de kans geven om impact te realiseren. Om, net als hun homoruchte voorgangers, geschiedenis te schrijven.
Yes, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and for me it's good morning. I'm in Switzerland at this moment, and if I look outside my window of my small hotel, the sun is rising, so I I will get more visible uh, by the minute. Uh, I started a little bit dark, but now I'm already uh, visible and will be only better. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, address you. It's a Pleasure to talk about the life and times of Christian Snoepervonje. Um, we only have um, uh, less than an hour uh, for, for today's uh, lecture, and uh, there's much more to say about uh, Snoepervonje, so I can only touch on a few important aspects of, uh, of his life and times. And uh, perhaps I uh, will enlighten you. A little bit with uh, with uh, new insights uh, um, uh, on this line. So, some of you are Leiden alumni, um, alumni, and if you are a Leiden alumni, you might um, remember that in the academy building of Leiden University there are two commemorative windows. Uh, and those windows were placed in 1950, so after the Second World War. And on the left side, there is Rudolf Klevinga. And the Rudolf Klevinga, of course, is the, is the person why we are gathered here, because of his uh, protest against German occupation in 1940. On the other side, there is William of Orange, Prince William of Orange, the founder of Leiden University. And he is surrounded with people uh, in, in the picture uh, who are uh, considered uh, people who, who, who were um, in the forefront of fighting for freedom, so fighting for Presidium Libertate, so that's the motto of Leiden University. So Hugo Grotius, the lawyer, is there, um, uh, Torbecke, so the author of the Dutch Constitution, is there, Cornelis van Vollenhoven is there, you might know him as the professor who did a lot of research on adult law, and Christian Snoek Bergonje is there. So he was in 1950 seen as one of the key figures uh, promoting freedom um, uh, at Leiden University. So he was famous in 1950, uh, and everybody considered him as one of the preeminent scholars of his time. Of course, as already been said, later on, let's say in the 80s, uh, he was considered in a much more negative way as, uh, let's say, a spy, a scholar spy who did his work not for science, but to give the colonial government tools to oppress the Indonesian people. So who is he? Who was Christian Sokogonje? And uh, today I would like to say something about his background, about his youth, about his days as a student at Leiden University. Of course, I will touch upon his travels to Mecca and his research over there. And uh, after that, I will uh, look at his role in Dutch East Indies in Indonesia. And two aspects I will try to talk about is his uh, vision on Islam in Indonesia in the first place. And secondly, his role in the war in Aceh. And then, of course, I will conclude with his times when he came back to uh, Leiden University and what he did at that time. So let's start with his uh, youth. And uh, Christian Sukhavonje had a, a special um, uh, uh, father and a special mother. Yes, so the next slide indeed. So this is his, the place where he grew up. It's in the province of North Brabant. It's a very rural place. Uh, in, in, 19, in 1857, um, a place which was not touched really with, with, with the modern times, as you can see on the picture. Um, but his father and mother had a special 
relationship. Why? Because his father was a preacher in um, the so the last. Let's go back to one slide. No, so please, please, please no, no, go back to uh, the, the, the slide with the, the, the little picture of uh, Oster uh, house in, in Rabel, because his father and his mother had a, had a special relationship. His father was a preacher in the province of Zeeland, was married, had five children, and while his wife was pregnant with the child number six, he fell in love with the daughter of his colleague preacher in the same village in, in Zeeland. And this was his mother. He made her also uh, pregnant. And uh, the two uh, fled. Uh, so now go back to the... Go back to the... Uh, I'm going too quickly now. Through the slides. Um, as, yeah, go back, please. So he was he, he, so so he says yes no so one back but, <clears throat> um so 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 he had he had the, so come back to his 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 youth so he had he had he had a special uh uh, uh he had special two two parents and um they uh, were yes there we are back again with his father and his uh, his mother and of course they were a little more or less expelled from the the wealthy family of the snooker coins because of the bad behavior of his father uh, they, uh, they 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 settled he was fired as as a preacher in the church and uh, they settled in this little village of uh, oster uh, uh, out in Brabant. His father died when uh, uh, Snook was uh, 13 years of age, so in 1870. And from that onwards, he was um, surrounded by his mother and his sisters. His only, he was surrounded only with women. And his mother decided to live a life uh, supporting Snook Foye with his um, uh, ambitions to, to, to learn. So they went to a secondary school in the town of Breda, and the family moved to Breda. And when Sukhavonje became 18 and wanted to study at Leiden University, he went to Leiden University. But also his family, his mother, traveled and settled in the town of Leiden. So next slide, please. Sukhavonje studied theology. Um, he studied theology, so the next slide. He studied theology, especially with Abraham Kuhn, so the professor on the left of the slide, was professor of the, so the, the one slide back, please. Uh, so he was professor of uh, uh, the Old Testament. Um, and what was special about theology at uh, Leiden University at the age when Snoop was uh, a student? It was the so-called modern theology, the time of the modern theology, uh, which um, um, uh, uh, considered theology as a science like any other science. So the Bible was studied in a very critical way and in a very historical way, so not in a theological way, I would say, but in a, a historical and theological way. And Mr. Alon Kuhn was a a world-renowned specialist at his that time, um, reconstructing the origins of um, the Old Testament in, in, in the Bible in a historical, critical way. And uh, this theological um, uh, approach, this scientific approach, uh, did um, influence Snooker Goye a lot. He was not religious, I think. He was much more agnostic, but not religious. And he started to really yeah, study ancient texts in a scientific way. After he did his uh, first exams in theology, he switched uh, to uh, the uh, languages of the Middle East as, as a study. So next slide, please. This is a super story, by the way. Yeah, the 
jeugd terug kunnen groeien as a, as a student in Leiden. And on the right is the Arab uh, professor of Arabic language, is Jan de Goeie. And he became uh, uh, Snoepke Groenje's uh, main supervisor, but also his friend. And he also, uh, de Goeie was also a scholar who studied uh, uh, text, uh, Arabic text in this in case, from his, uh, his study at, at Leiden University in a very, in, in a very critical and historical way. So Snoepke Groenje uh, graduated uh, from Leiden University in 1879, uh, and uh, decided to uh, continue his study and to write a PhD, uh, which was already introduced by Mark. Uh, he, he, he wrote his PhD on the, uh, the festivities in Mecca. And actually what he did in his PhD, and his PhD is very readable. If you uh, borrow his PhD, um, it's, it's a very readable, very well-written uh, piece of work in and uh, he, he published PhD in 1880. And again, this is a very critical way of, of dealing with texts around the times of uh, Mohammed uh, and his um, way of uh, changing the festivities, the existing festivities in, in Mecca into Islamic uh, festivities. And this is an important um, part of Sukhra uh, um uh, ideas about about Islam already visible in his um, his dissertation that you can see that existing uh, 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 elements existing cultures like walking around at the Arba for seven times it happened before Muhammad and but Muhammad made it into an Islamic uh, uh, a ceremony so this. Marriage, in a way, if you might call it, of, of local customs, of uh, local um, uh, uh, ideas with with the with Islamic religion, something which happened already from the start. He was not surprised by it, uh, Snooker for him, because he said to his uh, supervisors, to his professors, this happened, of course, with Christianity in Europe itself. If you look at Christianity in the south of Italy, it has a totally different shape and a totally different form than Christianity in Scotland or in Switzerland or in the Netherlands. Everywhere it's really connected with local culture and local customs and of course different um, uh, uh, rituals uh, uh, because of that. Okay, so this is uh, Snoeker Groenje in Leiden. So he became a real scientist, uh, a critical one. Uh, um, trained in a critical philological way of, of studying ancient texts, um, but he was not really, in the end, not happy about that way of dealing with uh, the study of Islamic societies. He said, because all of his professors at those days in Europe, they didn't travel to the Middle East or to Indonesia or to any other place, they simply studied Islam or the Arabic world or the Middle Eastern world from their study. Yeah? So they only stayed at a university or other universities and, and studied ancient texts. Snook thought you really have to go to the Islamic world to understand the Islamic world. And uh, fortunately for him, the Consul General of the Netherlands in Jeddah, Mr. Kruis, you see him here on the picture with a moustache on the left side of this little uh, group, of, of people, invited Snoop to come to Jeddah uh, to study uh, pilgrims from Indonesia. Uh, Kruid was a little bit concerned about the pilgrimage uh, to, uh, to, to Mecca. He thought perhaps uh, Indonesian pilgrims radicalize in, in Mecca, uh, become anti-government uh, in, in Indonesia, and he wanted to know more. And he asked the Dutch government, can you send a scholar uh, to Jeddah uh, to do this work? And he proposed Christian Snooker for you. What is an important little detail is that the Dutch government actually didn't want to fund uh, Snooker for you. They, they didn't want to have this uh, research. Uh, they were not concerned about the pilgrimage to uh, the Hajj to, uh, to Mecca, and they didn't pay for Snooker for you. So, uh, uh, Snoeper Goyen came to Jeddah, but not funded by the Dutch government. 
were the private funds who actually made it possible for Snoop to go to uh, to Jeddah. So to this is of course a little detail that Snoop well, was not a spy for the Dutch government uh, at this time in, in Jeddah and Mecca because the Dutch government didn't accept him. They said, well, he, he, he doesn't speak Malay, and so how can he really know what's going on uh, with the, uh, or any other language from the Indonesian archipelago? So, because Snoop of course, spoke Arabic, so how could Snoop really do research on all of those uh, uh, pilgrims? So, this government didn't uh, uh, want to fund a Snoop but Mr. Clark uh, gathered enough. Uh, money from private funds to 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 to, to have Snoop to uh, to to Jenner. This is the consulate, by the way, on, on the left side. This is the Dutch consulate uh, at those days uh, in in uh, Jenner. So so Snoop went to um, um, to Jenner and spoke to um, the people who who passed by um, on their way to uh, to to Mecca. The, in the end, thought you really should go to Mecca yourself. You should not just record the, the, the stories of people going to Mecca. You have to go to Mecca yourself. And this is what he actually uh, did. So he took an Islamic name, Abdul al Ghaffar, and he, um, he went to, to Mecca. Uh, and when he arrived, he did all the religious duties. Um, uh, uh, somebody is, 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 is supposed to do. And uh, later on in his life, he said this was the great, the arrival uh, in Mecca was the great uh, event in my life. The beginning of a medieval dream performed, performed in a sparingly illuminated temple. So he was really enormously impressed what he. Um, he um, Experienced in, in Mecca. Well, he settled down in Mecca. He got himself a house. Um, he lived the life of a, of a wealthy Meccan uh, man. He took a Ethiopian uh, slave as uh, as company, um, and he really observed life in in Mecca. He observed life in Mecca, and he observed. Uh, he not only observed it like in Mecca by his eyes, and he did not only wrote his no notes, but he also took pictures. So Snoop was a modern man. So this is quite uh, extraordinary, actually, from uh, of, of the 80s in the 19th century that he took with him a, uh, a, a, a photographer uh, a, a, and, and he made pictures of Mecca. So these are the first pictures, in a way, of, of, of Mecca, uh, which uh, in the end uh, reached readership in the Western world. So for the first time, people really saw how Mecca looked like. He also got uh, acquainted with uh, also Indonesian uh, Islamic scholars like Hassan Mustafa, who, who, who was already for 10 years uh, in Mecca. Uh, and uh, well, Snoop enjoyed his life very much. Well, because of a very, we don't have to go into into, into details because of a a, a, a affair, a, a a scandal about uh, 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 stealing uh, a stone, a, a archaeological a stone between um, uh, France and, and and Germany, he had to leave Mecca in September eighteen. 85. Back in the Netherlands, he wrote his masterpiece, Mecca, in German, so that everybody in the world could read it. Three volumes, um, a volume about, the uh, first volume about the history of Mecca, then his famous part on uh, society in Mecca, and a third part of the uh, book are pictures of Mecca. And these, of course, were very special. So next uh, slide, please. So these are the, the pictures which are also in uh, in in the book on on the left side you see the pilgrims uh, from Arche uh, of, of which he took a a, a, a a photo so he wrote his, his famous Mecca book he became world famous as an anthropologist as a, a scholar of Islam of Islamic uh, society 
uh, writing about simply the everyday life of, of people in, uh, in Mecca. Um, uh, one of his important conclusions, by the way, was that, that uh, politically uh, uh, the uh, pilgrimage to Hajj was not uh, dangerous at all. People were um, came to Mecca from religious um, uh, inspiration and returned back to home, uh, not radicalized or in any way uh, politically changed, but uh, religiously uh, enriched. So the Netherlands should not be afraid of the pilgrimage. <laughs> We oh, have 10 minutes left. Oh, then we have to go very quickly. I'm so sorry. I thought I had a little bit more time. Um, okay, then let's let's go to Indonesia because that was his his uh, his um, um, uh, so next slide, please. He went to Indonesia because he wanted to study Islam again uh, 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 in real life. Uh, so he asked for the Dutch government to go to uh, um, to send to send him to Indonesia, and he became advisor of the Dutch um, government. Next slide, please. And he settled in Bogor, but also settled in uh, the southern part of what is now made up uh, Medeka. So next slide, please. And it looked like this uh, at that time, uh, much quieter, no cars, uh, a, a good life. Next slide, please. Next slide. So the first what he did. So the first part I would uh, about his life in Indonesia, I would talk about his his uh, work on uh, uh, Islam, and uh, one of the uh, issues he had to deal with was the uh, uh, revolt in Banten in 1888. Uh, so a year before he came to Indonesia, and people uh, of Dutch Dutch uh, officials really uh, uh, looked at Islam as the source of the revolt in 88 in, in, in London. So Snook did research on, on that, um, and he saw that the uh, government of the Dutch East Indies um, uh, was um, dominated by the Dutch civil servants. You see one of them here on a chair besides a, a Bupati. Uh, who act, and those Dutch civil servants actually became had become much too dominant in um, uh, in in, in uh, colonial administration and also uh, not respecting Islam and that was one of the reasons why this revolt emerged. Next slide, please. He had his helpers. So uh, please, next slide, please. So his helpers, his assistants, so Hassan Mustafa on the on the, on the right side, and Said Utman, uh, both Islamic scholars, helped uh, Snook going uh, a lot with uh, his research on uh, Jarafa. And what did he actually uh, uh, conclude? So next slide, please. He concluded that again, uh, as that 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 Islam in on Jarafa uh, was. Um, uh, connected with the local culture, with local adults, and, got, and had, uh, had its own characteristics. But everyone in Indonesia was a true Muslim, according to uh, Snooker um, And not as some people in the Netherlands thought, uh, actually they were Hindu with a kind of uh, uh, Muslim appearance. No, you should not look at um, uh, Islam in Indonesia um, through the lens of, let's say, Islam in the Arabic, Arabic world, uh, Islam in Indonesia had its own appearance, but that made uh, people not less Muslim than, than for instance, in the, in the uh, Islamic world. So the Dutch should respect Islam, so Shunfer Pony uh, tried to convince the uh, uh, colonial government to respect Islam uh, and uh, also to uh, uphold uh, Islamic law, for instance, but then in a uh, in a good way. So, uh, so we made sure that only the gurus uh, were appointed, only those were appointed which uh, who uh, 
actually uh, knew uh, enough about uh, Islamic law. Next slide, please. So let's say. A um, uh, yes, we go back to we, we go to this uh, assembly line now. Uh, during his travels, so this is an, a, a a mosque in in, in uh, uh, on Java. So next, so his his his, his private life in uh, eighteen um, uh, he he got acquainted with the uh, daughter of a Jewish panguru in. Um, in uh, 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 on, on Java and uh, married with her, settled in uh, Jakarta, Batavia, and got uh, four children. So, next slide, please. The second issue which I would like to discuss is the issue of Aceh. Uh, at uh, Snook's time, uh, uh, the uh, attempts of the Dutch colonial army to control Aceh actually failed. So this is the early 19, 1890s, and the Dutch colonial army retreated uh, to a, let's say, a, 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 a lake fortress around Kuta Ratia at the north of, uh, of Aceh. And Snook was sent, so why, why did the Dutch actually try to control Aceh? That was because of the change in the commercial the sea routes after the opening of the Suez Canal. So after the opening of the Suez Canal, much more shipping went through the Strait of Malacca, and uh, there were um, uh, pirates uh, from Aceh making that sea route uh, um, uh, no, difficult to navigate, and the Dutch were pressured in a way by the international community to do something about it. And that's why uh, the Dutch tried to control Aceh, but they did not succeed. And in early 1890s, Snoop was sent to Aceh to do the, his research on, uh, on, on, um, on, on that society. He settled, he learned Achenese, uh, and uh, found out how uh, the society in Aceh was uh, 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 well, was constructed in a different way than people thought uh, before. So this is the uh, fortress. You see people, Dutch uh, soldiers controlling, trying to control everything which is going in and going out of uh, Kuta Raja. Next slide, please. So he wrote his uh, um, uh, analysis uh, uh, on um, on Aceh in the same way, in a way, as, as his book on Mecca. So there are, are two volumes, one on the history, one on the society of Aceh, with pictures uh, about Aceh. So it's a kind of mirror book on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, the situation of Aceh. And to summarize, he said, well, the Sultan of Aceh is very much unimportant, so we should have to, to uh, we should not deal with them at all. And the district, uh, uh, people who are controlling the, the districts, the district the heads, those are the people we have to uh, make an alliance with. And with the Islamic uh, teachers, the ulamas, we have to fight them. Anyway, this is in a very short nutshell what um, Snoop found out. And he thought when you do it, when you really uh, defeat the ulamas, you can introduce a just uh, colonial rule in Aceh and everybody will be happy. So this was his advice to the government. That advice was disregarded for four years because the Dutch thought that through Turku Umar uh, they could they had uh, their own uh, uh, ally to, to control Aceh. Of course Turku Umar then switched uh, sides and uh, started in uh, 1896 to fight uh, the Dutch government. And after that uh, a change really. Stukhovonia was uh, sent back to Aceh to, to fight the war. Next slide, please. And he was sent to Aceh uh, together with uh, General van Heus, who is on this picture. 
the man sitting on the left uh, behind the table, that is uh, General Jo van Heuts. Jo van Heuts and so was the military wing of the expedition to Aceh. And Snooker Hoye, who is on the left in the white shirt, he was the strategist, the thinker of the uh, expedition to uh, Aceh. Next slide, please. And we all know that this Aceh war was a very bloody war. Uh, Snooker Hoye had no uh, ethical um, problems with that because he thought you know, you have to fight your opponents, you have to kill them, but afterwards there will be a just colonial war, uh, rule, and this just colonial rule will be in the end better for local people than the rule of bandits, as we call them, uh, or uh, uh, ulamas. By the way, uh, so colonial wars uh, are. Uh, 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 Colonial wars, of course, are rather difficult to um, analyze because you can see the colonial army was also an army of people from Indonesia. Huh? So this is the picture, which is a gruesome picture, but gives you also some idea about the composition of uh, colonial armies at those, those days. So next slide, please. Back to his um, uh, private life, his wife died in labor, giving birth to a fifth child, which of course didn't didn't work out. And his four little children were then taken into the custody of the uh, Bupati of uh, Galu. And very important in the life of these uh, four children was Nasmita Kusuma, so the wife of the Bupati. A very strong woman again. So Again, a strong woman in the life of uh, Osnuka Poye. Next slide, please. Osnuk remarried uh, at the end of his stay in, uh, in Indonesia with Sita Sitarcha. And again, he was uh, more than 20 years older than uh, his second wife. And uh, they got one child called Yusuf. Next slide, please. So let me briefly then um, uh, discuss Luca Ponyas' uh, last uh, years. He, he returned to the Netherlands in 1906 because he got into, into you know, he was he was quarreling with the, the governor general, the same uh, Mr. Van Hertz, who he, he was, uh, who he, he, his partner in, in, in war in Aceh, he became uh, governor general and, uh, well, he didn't like him as governor general, then he returned to the Netherlands. He left his family behind. So this is the picture on the left side, his Indonesian family. He left them uh, behind in Indonesia, and he remarried again with a, a woman, and he got a daughter, Christina. There you see a, a daughter on the, on the right side. Ida from Ida Oort is the third wife of Snooker for you, who at that time actually technically, of course, was married with two women at the same time. Next slide, please. So he was respected as a, 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 a professor of Arabic and respected as a great uh, uh, scholar of, uh, of Islam. And he was very influential actually in, 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 in teaching all the civil servants who went to Indonesia uh, in the in the twenties and, and and thirties because he was the professor of, of of many of them. Next slide, please. So this is house. So those who have been to Leiden will recognize this house. It's called now nowadays it's called the Snooker Gronje House on the Ravenburg. Big houses. Why? Because actually, of course, the professors at those times, they lectured uh, from home. Huh? So the, 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 the first floor, the ground floor of this big house actually were lecture rooms for Snooker 
teaching his students. Next slide, please. He tried to uh, pick up his, uh, his uh, scholarly work uh, to study Islam in uh, Istanbul. You see him here at an Istanbul um, uh, hotel, but he never actually really managed to, to do a big work uh, of scholarship again. And he was quite sad about it uh, uh, during the last part of his life. He didn't, it didn't work out. Next slide, please. So what did he do after return to the Netherlands? He promoted the position of the indigenous, the Japanese um, uh, administrative elite. So he wanted to have a situation not in which the Dutch civil servant was dominating the Indonesian uh, Bupatis and Vedonos, etc., etc. He wanted to change that world and to have a situation in a way like on this picture, that the Bupati of uh, Surabaya, in this case, you know, is really the person in charge, and that the Dutch civil servant is more or less uh, reduced to an advisor. So he really wanted to uh, reinforce the position of the Indonesian elite. He thought this Indonesian elite can uh, hold Indonesia and the Netherlands together. Uh, they are. Uh, um, uh, able to live uh, a Western life as a Muslim together with the Netherlands. And in this way, Indonesia could uh, remain a part of the kingdom of, of the Netherlands. This was his, his, his idea. Next slide, please. And uh, on this picture, you see another famous Bupati on the left. Uh, the Bupati of Bandung, you are all in Bandung, this is Viranata uh, Kusuma on the left, but this picture is even more interesting because in the center it's Snook Gregorius' son, Yusuf, and he is marrying Madeleine Viranata Kusuma, so the daughter of the Bupati of uh, Bandung. Of course, Viranata Kusuma was a very famous one person, he was also a member of the People's Council, and actually, just a few weeks before the ceremony, uh, he went to the to to the office of the uh, telephone company in in Bandung for the first ever telephone connection with the Netherlands. And he spoke in Bandung uh, to a person in The Hague who was waiting for him, and that was Christian Snukkergoye. So one of the first phone calls between Indonesia and the Netherlands was actually a phone call between Biranata Fusuma and Snukkergoye. Nobody knows, of course, where those two people talked about, but perhaps they talked about the marriage of their daughter and their and his uh, his, his his son. Next slide, please. So Snook kept his connections with, with with Indonesia, also through this Office of for Indigenous Affairs, as it was called. So these were a group of people, most of them, some of them trained by Snook Kofoyi. Some of them uh, were assistants of Snooker Point during of his time in, uh, in Indonesia. If you look very carefully on the wall, you see a very small picture of Snooker Point uh, looking over this group of people. And they were advising the colonial government about uh, the nationalist movement, which was emerging, uh, about uh, policies, Islamic policies. And actually, they were, became very critical about Dutch colonial rule. And because of that, also, Snooker Gronje also became very critical about Dutch colonial rule. Actually, at the end of his life, he predicted he was very sad about his role in Aceh because it didn't work out as he was as he, as he thought um, uh, thirty years earlier. But he also warned the Dutch government to uh, change uh, course to make Indonesia uh, independent, and if not, he warned uh, the end of the relationship between the Netherlands and Indonesia will become violent, will become a violent end. So he really warns about, about that. Those people were advising the Dutch government to change course. Of course, as we know, the Dutch government didn't do that. Next slide, please. 
So one other way of Snooker um, uh, to be to remain uh, influential was because he picked, he handpicked all the consoles of, of, of Jeddah. You see uh, some of them. You see also um, uh, Mr. Van der Plas, who became governor of East Java in the end, uh, in, in the 30s. Um, they, they were all trained by, by Snooker Gronje and remained in, uh, in Jeddah. And because of that, uh, the, the Netherlands was one of the first countries to recognize uh, the rule of Ibn Saud in uh, 1926, because they had a lot of knowledge about what's, what's going on in um, in uh, Saudi, what the words now called Saudi Arabia. Next slide, please. So the Netherlands became a great partner because of Snoop Koyo of Saudi, of Saudi Arabia. You see uh, Snoop here one year before he died at the Crown Prince um, of, of Saudi Arabia in Leiden. Uh, he's walking to what is now the office of uh, the uh, Rector Magnificus at uh, Leiden uh, University. So Snoop remained influential, I, I, I would say. Next slide, please. But he was also sad. At the end of his life, I think he was sad because two reasons. One, he didn't produce a major uh, a scholarly work anymore. So he tried, but he, he was too busy with uh, um, yeah, all kinds of things. He did write in the newspapers, but he was never able to really do something really substantial in a scholarly life. So there was one disappointment in his life. And the second disappointment actually were the developments in Indonesia. His, I, his dream was that he could um, uh, uh, create an Indonesian elite who, was, uh, who would be willing to, uh, to join uh, together with the Netherlands a, a, a future. But he saw that the Dutch government actually left uh, his course and, and, and decided to, um, to, to become much more oppressive. Uh, to, to persecute um, in, uh, Indonesian nationalists, of course. He was, um, he did call the Dutch government small Hitler at, at the end of his life in Indonesia. Um, so he was very much sad about uh, the future uh, of, of the Dutch East Indies and he, well, he, he predicted it would end in, in, in bloodshed. So next slide, please. So, in 1936, he died, and he is buried uh, in this graveyard at Leiden. You can visit his grave. He is, again, with his women, his mother, and two of his sisters are also buried in this grave. So, this, he, his women during his life were all very important. So, to conclude, so what, how should we look at, at, at Snoopakoya? I think, well, you can all make your own conclusions. Uh, first of all, um, um, but I think there are there are three things I would I would say as as a conclusion. So first of all, Snukovoy was a famous scholar. He was really uh, the one who changed uh, the, the the scholarship on 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 Islamic societies uh, from uh, let's say people who were studying just texts to people who are studying Islam in, you know, everyday life. So he went to um, um, uh, yeah. recording in progress. He went to Islamic societies and, uh, and studied them uh, and, and really revolutionized, I think, Islamic uh, scholarship. So he was really the founder of modern Islam scholarship. So. So as a scholar, he, 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 was, he was very special. But secondly, he lived during colonial days. That's not his fault, but it is simply a fact. Yeah? So Snooker Hoy lived in a colonial uh, setting, uh, and he, he had um, yeah, all kinds of different influences within this colonial setting. So he was a, 
um, supporter of emancipation of the uh, uh, Sudanese and Javanese elites of Java, Madura. Um, he, but he, at the same time, he was also uh, an advocate of military intervention in, in Aceh. Uh, he thought that colonial rule was always better uh, for the people than, than another rule, and if that rule should be uh, um, 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 done with the violence, he had no problem uh, with it, with that. But at the same time, he wanted that Indonesians should have an important part, important place in that uh, colonial uh, structure. And also that uh, the government should respect um, uh, Islamic religion uh, of, of the population, uh, that the government should really make sure Islamic law was executed in a good way, and should also intervene when there were religious problems. And in the third place, this is still within a colonial uh, context, in a, in a third way, uh, third conclusion is that he changed his ideas uh, when he left Indonesia and, and returned to the Netherlands. He became very critical about uh, a Dutch colonial rule. He became even critical about his own um, um, interventions in, in, in Aceh. And he tried to really uh, educate his students in this more critical, in, in his more critical way. So it's up to you in a way to, to make the conclusion if it's right or wrong that he is one of those people in these glass paintings at the Academy building of Leiden University. It's up to you to conclude if he should be there with Rudolf Kleveringa uh, as one of the scholars who are um, defending the idea of presidium libertatis. So with that, I would like to end my little introduction. Of course, there's much more to say, but given the time, um, I will leave it to that. So thank you very much. But we, we heard that you have to go to the airport to catch your flight uh, soon, right? So yeah, 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah, would you, would you stay there for a few minutes to answer some questions? Yeah. Okay, right. Uh, I, actually, there are many people are, many, uh, many people are interested, interested in the Christian Stockholm. This is seen from, from many questions that we have received this afternoon. Okay, we have 16 questions. <laughs> but, of course, I will, I, will, I will summarize this question. But this question uh, uh, mostly talk about who is actually Snook Hugronia? Is he a scholar? Is he a spy? Was he a politician? Or is he a religious person? Okay. The second one. This, this is, I think, there's some effect, kind of confusion among uh, people here. Who, who, who is he actually? The second one is the question from our audience to you. They, uh, how did his advice and knowledge about Islam influence the Dutch government's policy on Islam Muslim in Indonesia? So I think, I think uh, uh, this is the summary of uh, the que from the question of our audience. There. So they would like to hear from you and to answer this question from your perspective. Thank you. Well, the first question, who is Christian Stukogonje? Well, that's, of course, a very complex one. I, I wrote uh, uh, 600 pages trying to answer the question, who is Christian Stukogonje? Um, um, yeah, let me, let me... He was a scholar. I think that's, that's, that's what I, I would like to stress first. He was really a scientist, a scholar who wanted to understand, uh, uh, in his case, he wanted to understand Islam. Yeah, so uh, this was his topic, his, his subject. He wanted to is, understand Islam and he wanted to understand Islamic society. Yeah, so not just the teachings of Islam, but he really wanted to understand how does this work in everyday, everyday uh, life. 
I don't think if you if you call him a spy, I think that's a very, very negative uh, uh, that has a very negative connotation. I, and I I would resist. I would I would not do that. I would not call him uh, a spy because because that's 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 significant. He had, he was genuinely interested in in Islam and Islamic society. He was a man of his time, so he thought that uh, colonial rule. Uh, is 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 more modern. Is is uh, is, is so it's better uh, for uh, for the people. But colonial rule should be informed again uh, by a good knowledge of uh, of Islam, and the colonial rule should. So this was his 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 big question. So you have a government who is in religious affairs neutral, and you have a population. Who in the majority is Islam, is Islamic. So how can you make the, the good arrangements? So he was really trying to figure out uh, that that question during his times at, uh, when he worked in Indonesia. Um, a scholar was he religious himself? Uh, that's another question. Perhaps nobody, of course, really knows what's going on deep down in a person. But I I don't think he was very religious. He was. Much more agnostic, but he lived the life of a Muslim. That's I think clear from newspaper clips from the times that he, you know, he didn't drink alcohol. It was written down. Uh, he didn't touch. Uh, 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 so, uh, not he, he. He he took only halal foods, and so he. I, I think he really lived the life of a Muslim without being. Very himself being very very religious. So who was Stupafonia? I think a scholar in a colonial context, um, 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 trying to 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 understand Islamic society. Okay. So this is I think the answer to the first question, not perhaps the entire answer, because yeah, it's 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 difficult to answer. So the second question is how this advice has really influenced uh, um, uh, uh, colonial uh, administration. I think he was very important. I, I, I think before he came, uh, the Dutch did not have a very clear picture on, uh, uh, on Islam in Indonesia. So there were all kinds of misunderstandings uh, about how Islam was functioning in, in, uh, in, in on Java. So Mainly he focused, of course, on the island of Java. And he, because of, of his research and all his advices, of course, you can read them also in Bahasa Indonesia. Eh? So they all translated his, his thousands of pages of, of, um, of uh, advices. If you read them, they are sometimes they are advices on very small topics. Eh? So two mosques who are quarreling about uh, funds or what, you know. So he makes decisions about uh, what he thinks is right in these kind of uh, small conflicts. And the Dutch government followed his advice because they thought Snook is the one who knows what is what is going on here. And, 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 and so these are all very small topics, sometimes uh, advices uh, on, on Islamic taxes. He made uh, uh, all kinds of advices. But mostly, I think, his, his influence was also on family the execution of Islamic family and family law. Um, he thought when he came that this was done not in a very professional way in uh, in Indonesia. He thought the Pengulu sometimes didn't know much about Islamic law, and he tried to change that. He really tried to uh, give people uh, much more certainty about Islamic law by uh, selecting the Pengulus, uh, um, uh, and also I think he's on the this trajectory, which which in the end uh, created a high court on Islamic law in, in 1938, uh, so in 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 Jakarta. So he really uh, uh, made that acceptable in uh, in in the Dutch East Indies. So I think he had a very great influence on that um, with regard to, um, to to the Dutch government. Of course, always with this idea that Indonesian Islam is a is a Islam of its own. Uh, he didn't he did not use the word uh, Islam Nusantara because that's not a concept of later days, but he was very much also stressing that the Islam in Indonesia had a had a character of its own. And he was really 
He's also, also he was uh, against uh, from the Arabic world because he thought that would give uh, uh, wrong influences from the Arabic world to Indonesia. And th these measures were also taken uh, uh, by the Dutch government by, to, 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 to really um, bring down the number of migrants uh, from, from Arabia. So he had a lot of influence on, on Dutch colonial, uh, on, on, the, on the government, yes, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Pak Wim. Okay, um, hadirin sekalian, uh, sepertinya uh, uh, konteks pembicaraan kita dengan Pak Wim mesti selesai di sini. Mungkin Pak Wim supaya punya banyak waktu untuk menyiapkan diri begitu, Pak Marik ya. Okay, selanjutnya we will have uh, another speaker, Pak Jaja Hormana. But sebelumnya, hadirin sekalian, saya kepada mahasiswa, Pak Wim sudah menjelaskan kepada kita semua Perjalanan hidup Christian Sunogoronya sejak dari Leiden, Belanda, kemudian ke Mekah, kemudian ke Netherlands, East Indies, Indonesia zaman Bahula, ya, sebelum merdeka, ya, namanya Bahula Netherlands, East Indies, lain Indonesia ya, Netherlands, East Indies, ya, yeah. oh iya, yeah. Netherlands, East Indies sama keruanya, kemudian dia balik lagi ke Belanda, nah itu Tadi perjalanan bercerita tentang perjalanan seperti itu, tentu banyak hal yang dijawabkan ya. Oke, okay. nah, Anda uh, nanti baca sendiri supaya lebih tahu tentang kontroversinya siapa Chris Pugronya ini. Uh, sebelum Anda ini saya ingin kepada Anda semua, we, we have 50 Leiden University merchandise or goodie bags for all of you, for those 50, as for, for first 50 attendants. Begitu ya, Mbak Rosai. Oke. Okay. Jadi yang hadir pertama kali 50 orang. Datang dari Anda, ada yang 50 orang pertama hadir di sini. Nanti lihat ada jadwalnya, akan mendapatkan merchandise Lady University. Dan itu sangat berharga. Kalau Anda pergi ke sana, harganya sangat mahal. Serius? Iya. Yeah. Ini ada 50 buat 50 peserta. Ini Anda mesti beruntung 50 orang ini. Selain harganya sendiri kalau satu Anda beli mahal, ya. Nah, ini luar biasa Pak Mari dan Mbak Rosa dan Mbak Zita bawa kepada kita semua oleh-oleh yang berharga ini. Ya. Dan itu tetap di sana ya. Jangan gelisah satu orang sudah gelisah. Oke. Oke. Uh, hadir sekalian, mari kita beri apresiasi kepada Profesor Wim Van Dendu atas urayannya yang luar biasa. Ini akan membawa insight bagi kita semua untuk lebih memahami di tengah kontroversi baik buruknya Christian Snogoronya. Terima kasih Pak Wim, mudah-mudahan minggu depan, tahun depan, Anda bisa hadir bersama kami di sini secara offline. Begitu Pak Wim ya? Oh iya lupa saya, dia nggak bisa. Pak Wim, we hope you will coming to our university next year offline. Okay. Thank you very much. We Thank you very much. Have a, have a very good day. Thank you. Have a nice flight. Yep, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hadirin sekalian, sepertinya sekarang kita baca Indonesia semua ya. Uh, uh, kita selanjutnya akan mendengarkan pembicara yang kedua yang luar biasa juga, Profesor Jajang Arohmana. Ya, beliau adalah dosen di fakultas kami. Dia lebih banyak karyanya menulis tentang uh, dari perspektif Islamic Studies, berbagai karya tentang tafsir Al-Quran, tafsir Sunda, dan sebagainya. Dan salah satu karyanya Pak Jajang ini tentang Sunogoronyo ini. ya. Tetapi lebih banyak dalam perspektif Islamic Studies-nya, kajian dengan hubungannya dengan tokoh-tokoh Islam yang ada di Sunda ini. ya. Tadi sudah disebutkan oleh Pak Wim, ada Hasan Mustafa, ada Said Usman. Nah, Pak Jajang ini karya-karyanya lebih banyak bercerita tentang apa sih relasi atau hubungannya antara Sunogoronyo dengan dengan apa dengan uh, Hasan Mustafa ini 
Hadirin sekalian, mari kita simak uh, urayan uh, diskusi dari Pak Jajan Wafana tentang keunggurannya ini. Ya, Kita minta gak lama-lama sama beliau ya. 15 menit cukup? Oke. Oh, Oke. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Oke, okay, Anda sudah gelisah ini. Karena jangan-jangan bisa karena terpaham dari idenya. Benar gak? Iya. Pokoknya kita ganti dengan wajah Jajang nih. Bahasa Sunda dan Indonesia ya. Jajang. Oke. Okay. Tapi boleh campur tiga bahasa Sunda, Indonesia, dan Inggris. Tambah ringgi di Belanda. Oke. Okay. Jajang. Silahkan 15 menit ke depan. Mari kita panaskan mereka kembali. Sekali lagi semangat. Thank you. Silahkan Pak. Ya. Uh, terima kasih. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your coming. Uh, I would like to say thank you for uh, coming. It's great to see you all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for uh, my dean, Professor Ahmad Ali Nurdin, um, all lecturers at the Faculty of Social Science and Political uh, Science, and Mr. Merrick Bellen and team from uh, Leiden University Representative Indonesia. Um, this is my uh, second time to speak on uh, SNOC, um, uh, the first event um, on May 13th uh, in this year at uh, Perpusnas in uh, Jakarta. Um, ya, yeah, uh, saya bicara nanti dengan campur-campur ya. Yeah. Uh, Mudah-mudahan tidak mengecewakan bagi uh, Pak Marik dan teman-teman. Uh, uh, di slide saya sudah buatkan dalam versi bahasa Inggris. Uh, uh, I would like to present again uh, Pandan Bruce uh, book. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, the greatest book on uh, snow uh, biography, I think. Uh, and if you want to know how uh, life of uh, snow, you must uh, read, uh, and of course you must uh, buy uh, the book. And uh, unfortunately, the, the price is for us is too expensive I think <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah I will explain to you about uh, Snow and his contribution to Islam study in Indonesia and then I will discuss Pandan Bruce's book and uh, finally I will uh, comment, uh, short comment I think uh, and um, give short uh, review of uh, review of Pandan Bruce's book um, next uh, slide please Uh, saya kira saya kehabisan bahan untuk menjelaskan uh, kehidupan Snow uh, uh, karena semua sudah dijelaskan very very uh, clearly uh, sangat uh, baik sekali oleh Pak uh, Dul uh, dari awal kehidupan sampai uh, meninggal dunia. Uh, who doesn't know Christian Snow Kogdolnya? Uh, is known as a scientist. Um, the father of Southeast Asian Islamic Studies, educator of uh, Indian people, advisor and uh, policy designer of the Indian government. And uh, of course, what he is uh, one of the most controversial Dutch scientists due to his uh, conversion to Islam. Uh, Snow uh, changed his religion to, uh, to Muslim and he then uh, succeeded Uh, in entering to the forbidden area in uh, Mecca and then he uh, his marriage to Sedan's girl and his involvement in conquest of uh, Aceh and uh, snow quite of friendship and association mean that he could not please everyone he was often admired as a great scholar of Islamic politics in the that is indeed but also despised for being What by what uh, a hypocrite and pretending to be open for Muslim. Uh, Muslim in Indonesia mostly accuse him as a snake in the grass. 
<laughs> Sorry. Uh, orang busuk dalam sin. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, but as a prolific writer, Snow continues to be remembered. His work is referenced by Islamic researchers in Indonesia. His name is always mentioned when discussing the success of his indigenous students, including um, Jaya Deningrat family, uh, Hussein Jaya Deningrat, uh, the first Indish uh, doctor in the Netherlands. Snow successfully became a mentor of Indish people, uh, such as Abu uh, Bakar Jaya Deningrat, Hussein Jaya Deningrat, Hassan and Ahmad Jaya Deningrat in Baden, and also Haji Hassan Mustafa, a chief penghulu of Bandung, Said Uthman, and uh, an advisor of Dutch government in Batavia and many other uh, Indian people. Um, Snow Pogronia was concerned with emancipating the Indian people, expecting that they would be capable of adapting the new 19th century ideas of modern culture. Um, and uh, consistent with the idea of adult supremacy, Snow assumed the, arist the aristocratic class would be the first group to be drawn into the colonial orbit. Uh, this uh, was reflected in his patronage of the uh, Jaya Dedingrat family uh, in uh, Banten. And uh, next uh, slide, please. In addition, Snow Adventures of uh, uh, as a polyglot, I think uh, Snow, uh, uh, he can uh, speak almost 14 languages uh, fluently, including Arabic, Sundanese, Japanese, Madurese, um, and many other uh, Indonesian uh, languages. And uh, it's very difficult to uh, ask to, uh, to follow his uh, uh, scholarly, uh, his scholar academics. And as the leading scholar and the architect of the Dutch colonial policy on Islam, Snow retained a special place in the historical memory of uh, Indonesia. And uh, this is especially the case of the Muslim, among whom the controversial labels of being Orientalist and anti-Islam spy are still, are still alive. Unfortunately, without the support of scholarly works, this controversy has been growing, leading to the creation of what can be said to be the myth-based perception on this Dutch intellectual uh, leader. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, for me and other scholars working on the history of Islam in Indonesia, the publication of um, a Pandendul book recounting the social intellectual biography of Smoke Hubronye by uh, Wim Pandendul must be highly appreciated. Uh, this is um, uh, the greatest book, uh, uh, the first book, the complete, uh, the most completed book on uh, the biography of uh, Snook uh, Hobronian. Compared to previous biographies of uh, Snook, uh, which have limited sources, Pandendul's book used very extensive source. Uh, it is not only from uh, Snook official writings, and uh, reports of, to the Dutch uh, government, but also from newspapers, family archives, Snook's diaries, and personal letters to his friends and colleagues from various countries uh, such as Netherlands, Germany, Arabia, and the Dutch East Indies. The sources are most uh, in Dutch. Uh, I cannot imagine how many sources Van Bull had to read to complete his this book, his uh, book. Um, uh, next slide, please. Pandendul um, described Snow's biography close chronology. He divided into uh, 13 uh, chapters that follow the pride of his life, which consists of uh, several sub chapters. Uh, he apparently collected all the material, sorted according to the chronological. Uh, the chronology of uh, Snow's life. Um, Pandendul is the most complete work compared to many other previous uh, writings that only highlight Snow's life in an incomplete manner. Pandendul succeeded 
um, uh, in describing the history of Son of Chutney from his early day until his death. Um, and uh, at the end, um, Dool tries to portray a snow figure in the midst of his controversy between uh, admired from a official teacher, college, and journalist on the, other, on the one hand, and uh, despised on the other, commenting on many Muslims who accused him for pretending to be a Muslim, but then Dool that uh, Snoop was not a religious believer. So it was not difficult for him to become a Muslim. He embraced skepticism and agnosticism. Yeah, this is um, important to us to um, highlight that uh, Snow is not a really, really uh, Muslim, a truly Muslim. He is a scholar. Uh, uh, he is tru uh, a truly a scholar, I think. Pandendul mengatakan dia sarjana murni. Uh, dia berupaya untuk profesional dalam kesarjanaannya. Dia tidak terlalu peduli dengan agama yang uh, dianutnya. Makanya uh, mudah saja kemudian sebagai seorang sarjana dia menggali pengetahuan itu bahkan dengan um, uh, berpindah ke agama sekalipun. Uh, makanya uh, ini satu hal yang tentu di luar uh, bayangan kita sebagai seorang penganut agama yang kita seakan uh, menganggap uh, agama tentu sangat bagi kita saja kita di visi di UIN <laughs> agama sangat sakral tidak mudah orang untuk melakukan riset kemudian berpindah agama tapi selalu mampu melakukan itu uh, jadi baginya ya uh, berpindah agama satu hal yang biasa jadi tak ada cara lain untuk melakukan riset di mana masuk ke kota suci Mekah yang saat itu sangat tertutup kecuali harus masuk Islam disunat disunat itu suatu hal yang tidak bisa dihindarkan dan serok lakukan itu maka kemudian tinggal di Mekah berhubungan dengan banyak uh, ulama di Mekah menikah juga kemudian ketika datang ke uh, Indonesia menikahi perempuan-perempuan Sunda kalau bukan karena uh, beragama pindah agama, bagaimana bisa? Dan informan-informan Snow, nanti yang di sekitar Snow, Hasan Mustafa yang ketika itu pernah ditemunya di Mekah, kemudian juga keluarga bupati yang juga uh, beragama Islam, tentu percaya sekali terhadap um, uh, keyakinan Snow yang berpindah agama itu. Persoalannya apakah Snow tulus ketika beragama? Uh, ini Urusan hati seseorang, kita tidak bisa membedah hati, melihat apakah ketulusan beragama itu betul-betul tulus. Karena ini urusan hati seseorang. Tetapi secara kasat mata kita melihat, ya Snow memang beragama Islam dan menjalankan ritual ajaran Islam dengan baik. Uh, ya, uh, ya, inilah yang kemudian bagi uh, Mostly uh, bagi Muslim Indonesia seringkali dianggap uh, kalau begitu uh, Snow bukanlah uh, apa ya bukan seorang Muslim yang benar-benar Muslim yang sejati, tetapi menjalankan misinya untuk mencari melakukan riset, mencari tahu tentang Islam dan masyarakatnya dengan uh, cara mengelabui uh, kaum Muslim saat itu. Tetapi apakah mudah melakukan itu? Saya kira Hasan Mustafa, Said Usman sebagai ulama-ulama di Atatia dan Sunda tidak sebodoh itu untuk kemudian menganggap Snow berusaha mengelabui mereka. Ini lagi-lagi persoalan uh, hati uh, bagaimana ketulusan uh, dalam beragama yang tidak bisa di, di, uh, diduga oleh setiap orang. Karena iman itu berproses dari satu keadaan ke keadaan yang uh, lainnya. Uh, nah, uh, next slide please. Um, saya kemudian memberikan satu saran ya, kepada bukunya Pandendul yang hebat ini. Uh, ini uh, hampir seribu, saya kira lebih dari seribu halaman, ya, hampir, hampir 700 nama halaman. Dan uh, satu kekurangannya saya kira lebih pada uh, 
Pak Dul ini bergantung pada sumber-sumber Belanda. Um, uh, saya tahun lalu mengunjungi Leiden di perpustakaan Leiden. Ada ribuan uh, surat-surat yang dikirimkan kepada Snow dan jumlahnya itu uh, uh, sangat luar biasa. Tapi tidak kemudian semuanya masuk ke buku ini ya, karena Pak Dul sangat bergantung pada sumber-sumber berbahasa Belanda. Uh, surat-surat yang ditulis oleh para informan dari uh, berbagai negara dari Saudi Arabia, dari Turki, dari Indonesia, dari Indonesia juga dari berbagai daerah, dari Madura, dari Jawa, dari Sunda, dari Sumatera, Aceh, itu berbagai bahasa, jumlahnya ribuan, dan sampai hari ini masih belum banyak dibuka, dibaca. Padahal uh, para informan itulah yang memasok pengetahuan, yang melimpah, untuk kemudian menjadi modal bagi Snow untuk memberikan nasihat kepada pemerintah Hindia Belanda saat itu. Nah artinya um, ada satu lubang saya kira yang bisa kita lengkapi dari buku uh, Pak Duli ini yang memang tidak ideal uh, kalau semuanya dimasukkan ke buku ini tapi kita bisa membuat buku yang lain untuk misalnya lingkaran informan yang ada di sekeliling Snow itu yang jumlahnya ribuan, mungkin puluhan ribu, belasan ribu ya. surat-surat, dokumen, manuskrip yang di Medan itu sangat melimpah dan belum dibaca oleh banyak sarjana-sarjana di kita um, mohon maaf Pak Dul sendiri tidak begitu uh, paham dengan bahasa Arab dengan bahasa Sunda apalagi uh, padahal surat-surat yang ditulis oleh para pejabat, para bupati itu ada yang bahasa Jawa, bahasa Sunda, bahasa Madura Bahasa Arab bahkan, karena Snow juga makin sekali bahasa Arab dengan Hasan Bismapa Saya melakukan uh, kajian Dan itu luar biasa, bahasanya sangat baik sekali um, uh, Ini saya kira uh, kekurangan, uh, sedikit kekurangan dari bukunya uh, uh, Pak Dul Yang uh, wajib dibaca oleh uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian uh, Uh, informasi yang saya pernah baca adalah Hasan Mustafa yang perannya sangat besar mempengaruhi kehidupan Snow. Ada ratusan uh, surat yang ditulis oleh Hasan Mustafa untuk kemudian dibaca oleh Snow dan dijadikan bahan nasihat. Termasuk surat-suratnya ketika Hasan Mustafa menjadi penghulu di Aceh. Ketika perang Aceh masih berkecam. Uh, bagaimana uh, Snow akhirnya mengambil sikap ya, itu atas dasar saran-saran dan Hasan Mustafa salah satunya Misalnya bagaimana Teku Umar itu pernah membelot kepada Belanda pura-pura Ada yang bilang pura-pura versi kita Tapi Hasan Mustafa meyakini Teku Umar memang saat itu betul-betul berpihak pada Belanda Dan berusaha meyakinkan Belanda Meskipun Snow agak curiga Karena Teku Umar terlihat banyak alasan gitu ya. Dia menembakkan banyak peluru kepada pasukan Aceh tapi tidak pernah ada pelurunya yang keluar hanya suaranya saja yang uh, keluar dan ada banyak cerita lain yang dilaporkan oleh Hasan Mustafa tentang kecurigaan perilaku yang uh, aneh gitu dari uh, Teguh Umar itu uh, overall I think uh, this book uh, makes an important contribution to the study uh, of knowledge and uh, history next slide please and uh, scholars of Uh, Indonesian uh, Islam um, which is uh, concluding I think uh, uh, the slide next, next slide please um, uh, scholars of Indonesian Islam cannot afford to miss no past uh, legacy of thought in studying social issue, uh, politics law, religion, customs uh, history um, and ancient manuscript It is difficult for uh, Dutch and European scholars to compete with uh, the greatness of Snook's name. Uh, Van den Doel presents Snook's uh, poetry, and uh, he read, uh, um, uh, he read uh, chronologically so as the position Snook and his informant in the right time and space situation, uh, instead of judging them with the perspective of current situation that is already independent as a, a nation. Um, ladies uh, uh, and uh, gentlemen, uh, so uh, we must read the history chronologically. Jadi 
kita saya menekankan bahwa pentingnya kita mendudukkan sejarah soft dan para informan itu dalam situasi zamannya secara kronologis tidak bisa kita lompat pada zaman kita baca zaman lalu masa lalu itu dengan situasi kita hari ini karena ada ketidakadilan kita menyorot orang lain pada masanya dengan cara pandang kita sebagai sebuah bangsa yang sudah merdeka dahulu belum ada Indonesia dahulu belum ada uh, uh, apa Indonesia belum merdeka makanya berbagai perilaku dari para informan termasuk Snow sendiri tidak bisa kemudian uh, kita kita lihat dengan cara pandang negara kita yang sudah merdeka dahulu pemerintah kolonial Belanda punya kekuasaan yang sah Uh, kalau dibilang absa secara politik dan kemudian um, uh, para pembantunya uh, dalam arti para informannya lah yang kemudian melancarkan memudahkan upaya pemerintah Belanda untuk terus berkuasa di, di, di Indonesia. Apakah mereka bersalah? Seandainya kita hidup pada masa itu, saya yakin uh, Pak Dekan mungkin kita sekalian juga ikut ke Belanda karena Belanda bisa menjamin kehidupan uh, sosial politik saat itu dan ada fatwa misalnya dari Hasan Mustafa yang mengatakan wajib hukumnya bagi muslim untuk taat pada pemerintah yang sah yang berkuasa saat itu tidak boleh kemudian uh, memberontak kepada pemerintah uh, Belanda dan ini sangat tentu sangat kontroversial uh, termasuk Yesus Man juga sangat kontroversial kalau dibaca dalam konteks kita sebagai bangsa yang berdaulat yang sudah merdeka maka penting kita mendudukan konteks dan situasi kesejarahan itu dengan baik sehingga tidak campur aduk dan menganggap sesuatu itu menjadi uh, tidak adil ya, bagi kehidupan uh, kita hari ini and um, uh, for me the publication of uh, Dul and uh, his insight on uh, the life of Snow Pogronya must be uh, highly uh, appreciated and uh, congratulations that's my Presentation. Thank you for your attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Just now, very much. Just now, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are coming to the question and answer session. I think a number of your ladies that you have many question about Snow Kubron. Yeah, yeah. Akan disampaikan kepada Pak Jajang, ya kan? There, there, there are many questions about Snow Kubron. But I think there is no question about the writer of this biography, Wim Van Den Doel. Pertanyaan pertama saya, apa hubungannya Wim Van Doel dengan si dua anak sekolahan? <laughs> saya tadi menanya itu Pak Mari, jadi saya akan berangkat dengan dia begitu. Boleh nanti ditanyakan ya? Oke. Okay. <laughs> Baik, saya akan buka open session untuk question and answer kepada hari ini sekalian kita ada waktu kurang lebih 15 menit ke depan ya uh, mungkin ada dua sampai tiga pertanyaan mahasiswa ada mahasiswa ada mbak dosen ada ya, mahasiswa ada mahasiswa oke okay. waduh banyak saya ingin dari mulai yang perempuan dulu tadi yang kebanyakan laki-laki itu tiga perempuan mana tadi yang tadi yang perempuan di situ pojok itu Mahasiswa, mahasiswa turun lagi tangannya, kenapa? Tadi ada tangan, iya, ada tangan. Ya, perempuan dulu yang di situ. Tolong sebutkan namanya, eh, jurusan apa, semester berapa, supaya Pak Jajang tahu Anda ini. Tadi ada angkat tangan, ada angkat tangan ya? Oke, ya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, saya Mawar uh, dari kelas 1D Administrasi Publik. Uh, jadi saya ingin nanyain soal materinya. Uh, jadi itu saya namanya. Uh, tokoh yang dikatakan maaf saya nanya namanya soalnya susah. Susah ya. Iya. Jadi kan e, kalau yang saya tahu orang itu 
masuk Islam karena karena pengen nanti sangat Islam kan. Nah, e, jadi dia tuh sebenarnya masuk Islam karena ingin mendidik atau dari dulu besar dia. Ada beberapa yang saya akan tanyakan. E, kebetulan sebelum ini dimulai, saya sedikit baca tentang biografi tentang Christian Shock. Ya. E, pertama e, di beberapa e, sumber yang saya baca, ternyata Shock ini beberapa kali menikah ya. Ada yang empat kali, katanya ada yang tiga kali, dan itu dua kali. Menikah di daerah Ciamis dan Bandung Kalau nggak salah ya Tolong dikoreksi Dan yang terakhir yaitu kembali ke Belanda Sampai meninggal dunia dan menikah uh, Yang saya tanyakan pertama Ini ketika dia menikah dengan orang Ciamis Kalau nggak salah ya Dia mempunyai anak Yaitu kurang lebih 4 atau 5 lah Yang kelimanya kalau nggak salah meninggal dunia Kemudian yang keempat Yang keempatnya itu uh, Masih hidup Saya pengen nanya, uh, mudah-mudahan sebetulnya anak-anak ini masih ada menjadi saksi hidup yang bisa memperlengkap biografi dan snowco, snow ya, yang tentu menjadi penguat uh, tentang uh, kontroversi yang tadi disebutkan tentang snow. Dan saya pun yang keduanya mungkin uh, kita belum jelas kontroversi snow itu apa sih itu yang, yang, yang mendasar. Karena tadi disebutkan ada beberapa e, dikatakan Islam ini Islam. Tapi saya baca di beberapa biografi, beliau itu tidak Islam. Hanya mempunyai tujuan yang memang sebagai peneliti. Posisinya sebagai peneliti di mana dia memposisikan untuk mencari e, sebuah informasi, maka dia memposisikan menjadi Islam. Tapi bukan Islam. <tuh> yang saya Uh, 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 baca beberapa sumber itu ini kontroversi juga mungkin dari yang dikatakan oleh sumber karena memang beberapa sumber uh, tidak ada yang mengatakan bahwa Islam ini Islam hanya mungkin dia mempelajari Islam kemudian dia pernah ke Arab atau ke Arab pun dia tidak haji karena dia prosesnya untuk meneliti kemudian yang kedua dia ketika pulang dari Arab Dia membuat sebuah tulisan dalam satu buku ya, karyanya yang eh, Mekah, ya. Mekah ya, yang terbuat ter- 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 ini dua jilid. Saya pengen tahu isinya apa sih sebetulnya. Yang kedua itu, karena ini tidak tidak diungkapkan di beberapa sumber saya baca, da- buku ini tentang apa, gitu. Kemudian yang terakhir ini yang menonjol. Snow ini di Aceh saya baca ini memang yang sangat menonjol tentang Acehnya ini bagaimana dia meneliti tentang Islam bukan Islam tapi bagaimana dia meneliti tentang para penganut Islam di Aceh karena bukan meneliti tentang Islamnya ternyata dia meneliti tentang eh, apa paham keislaman yang para penganut di Aceh eh, Islam di Aceh Kemudian yang saya tanyakan Islam di Aceh itu seperti apa pada waktu itu ketika Snow ini meneliti uh, sampai mungkin beberapa lama paling lama di Aceh kalau misalnya dia meneliti tentang keislaman ataupun para orang Islam yang ada di Aceh. Terima kasih itu saja yang bisa saya sampaikan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh. Saya harus adil kepada semua yang ada di sini, tapi karena itu harus yang berbicara yang bertanya mungkin mewakili tadi mewakili ya barusan mahasiswa yang barusan dari standik. Nah sekarang ingin kembali kepada Pak Dosen, Pak Hasan Mustafa, informannya sinoku bukan ya bukan <laughs> bukan ini dua ribu ini Doktor Hasan Mustafa. Kemudian juga nanti bakal dari tamu kita Pak Marif ya. Silakan nanti jawabannya akan di 
dirangkum oleh semua Pak Jajang. Mundur diri. Bim, bim. susah itu bagi orang beragama seperti yang taat <laughs> ya ya oke okay, baik oke okay. oke okay. okay, thank you uh, terima kasih Pak Malik mau nggak
nanti ditampilkan ya sosial medianya. <laughs> Oke, okay. baik uh, Pak Jajang, silakan ada empat uh, pertanyaan yang sudah atau komentar dari hadirin kita. Mudah-mudahan bisa selesai sebelum jam empat kita ini. <laughs> silakan. Ya, terima kasih atas uh, pertanyaannya. Memang bicara stroke. Paling pertama pertanyaan pertama yang selalu ditanyakan adalah tentang agama. Uh, mungkin karena kita mayoritas uh, umat beragama yang religius, uh, selalu begitu. Saya berkali-kali ketika di uh, Persiknas, kemudian di UIN uh, Jakarta juga isu tentang agama yang dianggap oleh Slope ini selalu menjadi pertanyaan. Ya, uh, uh, ya. Ya, ini tidak bisa terhindarkan. Uh, tetapi, uh, apakah stroke kemudian uh, tulus dalam beragama? Lagi-lagi saya nyatakan, ketulusan dalam beragama itu ada pada hati setiap kita, setiap orang yang tidak bisa dinilai dari uh, wujud luar penampakan uh, siapapun yang beragama. Uh, uh, dan Mengapa Snow kemudian uh, mudah uh, berpindah uh, agama? Hanya Snow yang tahu uh, mengapa kemudian Snow uh, berpindah agama. Sampai kemudian disunat, uh, di bukunya Mekah itu diceritakan sampai berdarah-darah ketika disunat. Karena belum ada laser saat itu. <laughs> Jadi disunat ketika dijedah sebelum masuk ke Mekah. Uh, belum ada laser. Jadi... Tetapi Snow rela melakukan itu karena dia sejak di legend dididik oleh para maha guru yang concern terhadap tradisi riset yang kuat. Ada uh, apa uh, uh, Guze, kemudian ada uh, Goldziher, ada Noldek. Saya kira di teman-teman di lingkaran Snow sebagai sarjana yang uh, sangat uh, tersohor saat itu mendorong untuk Snow melakukan hal yang serupa. Bahkan kemudian, uh, walaupun Snow sudah selesai PhD saat itu, skala S3, tapi kemudian Snow belum puas untuk kemudian akhirnya masuk uh, ke kota Mekah, ke jantungnya uh, uh, umat Islam saat itu ya, di Mekah. Dengan, bahkan dengan cara apapun akhirnya masuk ke kota Mekah saat itu. Nah, uh, apakah kita sebagai muslim uh, di UIN misalnya bisa melakukan itu? Uh, ya, uh, saya bagi bagi kita uh, Muslim memang ada doktrin yang agak susah memang untuk kemudian kita melintasi batas-batas uh, keagamaan yang kita anut. Uh, kita tahu semua tentang itu. Uh, tetapi uh, ya ini terserah menyerahkan kepada uh, minat uh, kerja keras, niat tujuan dari setiap uh, orang. Untuk kemudian dia melakukan uh, riset. Memang ada anggapan subjektivitas, uh, objektivitas itu tidak bisa dicapai. Kalau seorang riset itu dia tidak uh, merasakan langsung kehidupan uh, masyarakat yang hendak ditelitinya dengan baik. Ya. Dan ini umum saya kira dalam tradisi masyarakat uh, Eropa tapi tidak semuanya. Ada yang melakukan itu tapi ada juga yang uh, tidak. Tetapi... Bagi mereka yang ingin merasakan langsung sebagai bagian dari dinamika keimanannya, kemudian menikah, masuk ke lingkaran masyarakat yang hendak dia jadikan objek riset itu. Entah itu menikahi anak kepala suku, misalnya di Papua, sampai kemudian masuk ke lingkaran sukunya, bertahun-tahun hidup di situ. Atau seperti Snow, masuk ke kota Mekah yang saat itu terlarang hanya bagi mereka yang beragama Islam. Dan Snow berhasil melakukan itu, Bahkan mampu melaporkan dengan sangat baik uh, kisah bagaimana orang-orang um, Hindia Belanda yang menjadi haji uh, di Mekah saat itu. Tujuannya apa? Ya dalam konteks politik, kita tidak bisa menghindarkan itu. Ada uh, pasca 1888 pemberontakan di Cirebon, um, termasuk juga perlawanan masyarakat Aceh terhadap uh, Belanda. Pemerintah Belanda seperti kehilangan akal untuk menaklukkan Aceh dan 
menaklukkan pemberontakan di Jawa saat itu pasca Diponegoro dan juga e, gerakan e, masyarakat di Cirebon maka seroklah yang pertama kali kemudian memecahkan kebuntuan itu dengan cara apa dengan cara mencari tahu sebetulnya doktrin apa yang pengaruh mereka sampai kemudian mereka berani mati untuk melawan pemerintah kolonial Belanda dan akhirnya Snoke masuk ke Mekah dan ingin mencari tahu sebetulnya koneksi apa yang dilakukan di Mekah itu semangat apa yang buat mereka itu terus e, menggebu-gebu ya untuk melawan pemerintah termasuk kecurigaan Aceh saat itu menjalin komunikasi dengan pemerintah Turki Utsmani pemerintah Ottoman saat itu dan itulah yang kemudian oleh Snoke e, berhasil di, diungkap bahwa untuk menaklukkan Aceh sebetulnya bukan dengan cara memerangi semua orang Aceh yang melawan para pemerintah Belanda, tapi ulama lah yang menjadi kunci penting perlawanan masyarakat Aceh itu. Karena tidak semua orang Aceh itu juga eh, apa, punya keyakinan sebagaimana para ulama. Maka Belanda atas saran seru kemudian mendekati para ulebalah, para tepu, aristokratnya atau menaknya, para elit di Aceh itu. Sehingga Uh, hanya ulama-ulama saja yang kemudian diperangi oleh pemerintah Belanda. Sementara Uwe Belang dirangkul, dijadikan teman, dijadikan informan. Dan uh, Hasan Mustafa melancarkan upaya uh, pemecahan masyarakat Aceh itu dengan Snow saat itu. Dan akhirnya berhasil. Bagaimana misalnya um, apa, uh, para ulama yang uh, bersikeras melawan misalnya Tepuk Muhammad Saman, uh, Ditiro, ya, itu akhirnya juga tewas terbunuh. Kemudian juga uh, uh, para tepu yang berusaha membelot itu juga kemudian akhirnya diperangi oleh oleh pemerintah Belanda. Artinya untuk menaklukkan masyarakat Aceh itu tidak dengan membantai semua uh, para para pejuang uh, atau orang-orang uh, Aceh, tapi dengan cara memahami uh, dorongan perang sabil yang muncul dari doktrin para ulama itu dan mereka lah yang akhirnya diperangi dan Uh, paling tidak Snoke lah yang kemudian berhasil nanti uh, meredakan perlawanan dari uh, masyarakat Aceh ya, saat itu. Nah, uh, itu saya kira yang uh, kalau kontroversinya jelas tadi saya uh, ungkapkan. Jadi uh, ketika Snoke masuk Islam, itu rentetan kehidupannya uh, kemudian dialami karena uh, dapat dengan mudahnya dialami ketika Beliau dia sudah masuk Islam, bisa masuk Mekah, menikah dengan anak e, Bupati Ciamis, ya, kemudian menikah juga dengan anak Bupati e, Wakil Bupati Bandung, Khalifah Kapo, gitu, dan punya keturunan di Indonesia. Ketika di Perpusnas banyak keturunan Snook yang datang dan hadir, mereka beragama Islam. E, jadi e, e, saya kira ya agama punya konteksnya masing-masing ya bagi bagi uh, kita ya sebagai muslim dalam melihat sosok Snow. Snow awalnya lahir dari keturunan uh, Kristiani yang taat di Leiden, tetapi kemudian berpindah agama. Tapi ketika sudah kembali lagi ke Leiden, akhirnya berpindah agama kembali uh, menikah kembali dengan uh, Catherine kalau nggak salah. Sampai akhirnya meninggal dunia. Tetapi perubahan agama dari satu agama ke Loewe tidak bisa dipandang hanya dalam sekejap mata. Saya kira ada fase-fase dinamika spiritualitas yang bergejolak di situ dalam setiap diri orang. Sesuai dengan apa yang dirasakan dan dialaminya. Sama halnya saya kira dengan peristiwa kalau dalam Islam ya. Peristiwa misalnya para sahabat Nabi yang juga berpindah agama dari ketika masuk Islam, ya, kemudian mengalami pergolakan-pergolakan dan seterusnya. Lah. Jadi eh, agama itu persoalan hati. Hanya memang di kalangan Muslim karena melihatnya dari sisi luar, itu kemudian dengan cepat mengambil kesimpulan bahwa kalau begitu eh, eh, Snoke ini eh, musang berburu domba. Musang berburu domba. Atau uh, apa tadi uh, Musuh di, di bawah Trimur ya, uh, Yang membuat uh, uh, Masyarakat muslim Di Indonesia itu menjadi uh, Tertipu Dalam tanda petik dengan keislamannya ya. Karena disegani Snow ini punya keilmuan yang tinggi Bahasa Arabnya pasti uh, Dianggap uh, 
Syekh gitu ya di Mekah juga bergaul dengan para ulama yang levelnya sangat tinggi ya Syekh Abdullah Jawawi dengan Ahmad Zaini Dahlan para masayif di Mekah saat itu kemudian ketika di Hindia Belanda di Indonesia disegani juga oleh para alumni haji ya, oleh jaringan alumni haji yang ada di pesisir pantai dan juga mengangkat Ada satu Kalau mendekati kaum Thank <laughs> you. 
Baik, terima kasih. Alhamdulillah akhirnya rangkaian seluruh acara dari Clever Inga Lecture telah selesai dan sudah berjalan dengan lancar. Uh, banyak ilmu dan informasi yang kita dapatkan dari diskusi kita kali ini. Semoga ada manfaatnya untuk kita, khususnya ini banyak para mahasiswa ya. Alhamdulillah banyak para mahasiswa di sini yang tidak luput akan belajar sejarah sampai kapanpun. Kemudian ada beberapa mahasiswa atau tamu Uh, hadirin dari luar UIN Sunan Gunung Jati, terima kasih sudah uh, meluangkan waktu untuk hadir dan berpartisipasi aktif dalam kegiatan kita hari ini. Untuk selanjutnya, sebagaimana yang tadi sudah disampaikan oleh Bapak Asep Muhammad Iqbal, hari ini kita akan melakukan pertukaran cendramata antara uh, fisik UIN Sunan Gunung Jati Bandung dengan Leiden. Mangga dipersilakan Bapak Dekan sama Mr. Marik. Baik, selanjutnya kita foto bersama terlebih dahulu. Hadirin mohon untuk berdiri. 